So now that we've seen the view of what it meant to Paul to talk about the Lord Jesus, okay, let's then take a look at what it meant to Paul to talk about the question of pre-existence. And here I'm saying, again, the great weight of the evidence falls in this perspective that Paul didn't believe that Jesus literally pre-existed himself. Again, very confusing. It's one of the worst cases of proof texting ever to try to find a pre-existent Christ in Paul. And uh, that's really something because uh, when you think about it, Paul doesn't really talk that way. He, Paul, by one count, he wrote 13 letters that have been divided in all up into more than 2,000 verses, Okay. And out of Paul's 2,000 verses, we know he's referring, using the word Christ or Lord 500 times, right? And we know he's not using the word God with reference to Jesus any times. But isn't it interesting that out of 2,000 verses, I have not yet found one clear indication that Paul was saying Jesus preexisted himself as any other kind of being, okay? So I do think that our matter of conceptual pre-existence, existing in concept, sometimes you hear it called notional pre-existence, and that's okay. I just think concept, conceptual, makes a little more sense to me, so I'm using that. But uh, conceptual pre-existence is sufficient in the long run to explain the scriptures on this matter. It works better. And... It's also quite beautiful. So we're going to look at four or five things here that Paul was a believer about in terms of pre-existence in Jesus, okay? And uh, here's uh, what we're going to say. First of all, point number one, Paul was a, what? Conceptual pre-existence guy, wasn't he? He was a conceptual pre-existence believer, not a literal pre-existence guy. And, And we begin to pick this up. Uh, Paul says uh, in his view that things exist in the mind and plan of God before, before they come to exist in reality. Before they come to exist literally. So, and Paul makes an exposition about this very point. In Romans 4.17, he quotes an Old Testament scripture, Genesis 17 and 5, and he says this, As it is written, I have made you, this is God speaking in, in the passage, I have made you, speaking to Abraham, I have made you a father of many nations. Paul then says, He is our father in the sight of God. Speaking of Abraham, he's our father. The God who gives life to the dead and does something else that Paul says is absolutely amazing. He calls things that are not as though they already were. Isn't that so neat? What Paul is recognizing, and uh, anyone familiar with the Old Testament would have known what he was saying. How is it that he was the father of many nations? He's looking around and saying, oh, where's all these nations that I'm the father of? Whoa. You see, in conceptual preexistence, when you're talking about the concepts that exist in the mind and the plans of God, that's big. That's huge. So much so that when God calls something like this, it's as good as done. And he's able to say, Abraham, I've made you the father of many nations. I love that. That's conceptual pre-existence. And it's beautiful, isn't it? Another place. God says to Abraham, I have given your descendants the land. Again, he didn't have any descendants to take that land at that time. What do you mean I've given it to you? So you can have things with God when you're not even there yet. Isn't that interesting? Jesus had a glory with God in God's plan and in his program, and he wasn't even there yet. Isn't that amazing? And, and then in, uh, later on in the 17th chapter of John, he says, Now, O oh, Father, give me, 
Give me that glory that I had with you there in the beginning. Jesus was in the mind and the plans of God, and Jesus knew those plans. Give me now that, that plan. So it's wonderful. So Abraham's descendants had things before they existed to have things. And Abraham had descendants before he had descendants. But not literally. That gets very confusing, doesn't it? It doesn't work. Okay. Then we find Paul saying this in Ephesians, the first chapter and verse 4, when we're kind of studying out Paul's language and the way he thought. But Paul said, just as he, that is God, chose us in Messiah, in Jesus, the anointed one, before the foundation of the world. And he chose us to be holy and blameless before him in love. Now this is an interesting thing. How can you choose somebody when they're not there to be chosen? Yet, he chose us. If you, God chose people that he could, by his foreknowledge, look ahead and see that they would trust in Christ. Those who would trust in Christ, God selected them to live in this life and to live in the life to come. But he selected them ahead of time. Isn't that beautiful? Doesn't mean he made them believe. Uh, it goes too far. Anyway, but Paul is saying, just as he, God, chose us in Christ, in Messiah, before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless, wow, before him, in love, we were not there literally. Nor was Christ there literally. Think about this for a moment. I think this is an important point. The word Christ means anointed. Well, that's not a LP kind of thing. That's not a literal pre-existence kind of thing. Christ wasn't anointed in heaven. Where was Christ anointed? When did he become Christ? Wow. He became Christ here on earth. He became Christ when he was anointed by God, right? He was made to be Christ. He wasn't innately Christ. So, very important verse. Acts 2 and verse 36. Everyone should know this one. It's very important. Acts 2, 36. And Peter, on the day of Pentecost, is saying, Hey, men and brethren, you people, you know, God has done what? Made that same Jesus that you crucified. And again, he's identifying the Jesus, right? Because there was more Jesuses out there. Okay, it was a lovely name, wonderful name. God chose for his son to have that name. That's wonderful. But Jesus, the one you crucified, God has made him Lord. And God has made him Christos. God has made him Christ. God has anointed him and made him Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So... So he wasn't Lord in heaven. He wasn't Christ in heaven. He wasn't even anointed or made Lord until he was born. And then God sent him. Remember, we talked about that with John. God, people were born and then they got sent out on their missions, right? And uh, so it was with Jesus. So Acts 10, 38, again, is another very important where, you know, uh, where that Peter is speaking to the household of Cornelius and says basically the same sort of thing. He said, you know, that God, God has anointed Jesus with Holy Spirit and with power. And he went out and did what? He went about healing what? Everybody who was oppressed of the devil. For he was God. No, God was with him. Notice that language. Okay. So this is what we're seeing here then. Jesus didn't literally pre-exist as Christ or Lord or anything else for that matter in heaven. He was God's human son. He really was begotten of God. He was born of a virgin. It doesn't get better than that. God loved him greatly. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so then it's because of that that God anointed him. It's because of that God made him Lord. Okay, made him the Lord Christ. So uh, uh, we then were foreknown by God uh, ahead of time, and so was Jesus. And so again, I say Paul was really, he really was a conceptual pre-existence guy. We're on the same page with Paul in that regard. And, uh, and I think if you begin to study uh, the, any of the issues that people, or scriptures that people bring up, saying he literally pre-existed. I think with the things we're talking about here, 
about conceptual pre-existence and other things that we're referring to along these lines, you'll be able to answer those pretty comfortably. We should be able to. Okay. Another thing that Paul was, he was a typological believer. Okay. We talked about this a little bit with John. And that is that Jesus existed in a, in a form, if you will, uh, in the form of a type or types uh, of things that were in the Old Testament. I, I think we can understand this. Not too bad. It doesn't mean he was really those things. It just means they represented him. They gave us a picture, gave people a picture of the Christ and what he was going to be doing and what he was going to be like. It doesn't mean he was them back there. It gets kind of uh, strange when you do that. So here's a, an example. Uh, and that is the sacrifices of animals under the law and the blood of those sacrifices. They're pictures of Jesus and his sacrifice, his ultimate sacrifice, and of his blood, the blood that he shed for many for the remission of sins, as he said. Well, those sacrifices back there become a type, if you will, uh, a picture of what the Christ was going to do fully. Okay, and, uh, and so those things are back there. But they're typological. He wasn't the animals. He wasn't the sacrifices. That wasn't his literal blood. That was just a type of him. So then uh, uh, when we move along then, we find that uh, the types are often expressed as metaphors. Okay. And so we're finding then that Jesus, he was not literally... Uh, Old Testament things themselves. But literal Old Testament things foreshadowed or forepictured him, Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 10 and 4, we mentioned this before, but uh, I think it's worth mentioning again here as we're talking about Paul. But here's Paul saying, uh, he says, and they all drank, speaking of the people back into the Old Testament, right? They all drank of the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them. That rock was Christ. Interesting. And so this used to be one of my very favorite verses when I was a literal pre-existence fellow, okay? And I thought, oh my goodness, well, I'll show people here. Jesus was back there. Then I began to realize, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> this is a type. It's a shadow. It's not to be taken literally that he was back there in that sense. And by the way, he clarifies that in verse 6, two verses down, where Paul says, now these things happen to them as the many translations say examples, but the word is tupos, the word we get our word types from. So he was a type for us. That was a type to show us things and the things that happened to them. So what I think Paul is referring to is back there, we had on more than one occasion, so this rock seems to show up there, but they had a rock. And remember how that Moses struck the rock and water gushed forth and the people drank and were saved, but he wasn't supposed to have smitten the rock. All of that is a foreshadowing of Christ. Christ, they weren't supposed to kill him, but they did. And then what happens for all who, who Jesus says, come unto me and drink. Okay. So everyone who comes to Christ, they drink of water and they'll live forever, as he told the woman at the well in John the fourth chapter. So Jesus wasn't a rock back there following him around. What is, was it being an awfully strange rock, wouldn't he, with two legs? He'd say, well, I guess it's time to go again, and here he goes. That's not what this is about. Item number three, Paul was a man as our Savior believer, okay, as we are. We're celebrating the wrong things in Christianity over these centuries. And I'm not saying everybody, but in, in great measure this is the case. We've been celebrating Jesus the God. We've been celebrating Jesus the God-man. Those things are not true. That's not what we should be celebrating. We should be celebrating that, G, that God chose to have a true human son, one of us, to stand up for the good of the rest of us, who God chose and loved enough that he chose him to be able to die for the sins of the rest of us and be a sacrifice for the rest of us. So this later idea then, uh, that the, the idea that, well, but Jesus had to be God uh, in order to get a salvation because no man could do that. Total misunderstanding. 
this is uh, no, not uh, so. The so the so he had to pre-exist, and if he was God, because always God's always existed, it gets very confusing, and you have to write your own storyline at that point, which they do. But the truth is this, our very hope of salvation is hinged on Jesus being what they say he can't be. Truly one of us, really one of us. That's our hope, that's our salvation. And that's so critical. As I mentioned before, God didn't sin. Humanity sinned against God. God didn't need to personally sacrifice himself to himself for somebody else's sins. No. It is we, humanity, that had sinned, and it was we, humanity, who needed to make atonement to God for our sins. God worked to give us one of us that was worthy to stand for the rest of us, and he accepted him for the rest of us. That's wonderful. That's what we should be celebrating. But Christians can't celebrate that because we're too busy making him either an angel man or an angel like fellow or, uh, or a God or some part of God. These are strange ideas. They're not right. They're just not. So then we find Paul, he's the one telling us this. And, and I will make this challenge, but I think uh, Paul is saying here that it took a man to save us, a real one of us, okay, as much as Adam was, okay. And uh, then uh, Paul is going to lay it out in Romans 5, 15, but the gift, the gift of salvation, hope, is not like the trespass, the sin, for, in, uh, for if the many died by the trespass of one man, who? Adam, of course. And how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man Jesus Messiah, the anointed Jesus. Wow. Overflow to the many. This is the very thing they say can't be. Oh, no, a man can't buy our salvation. Well, you'd better talk to God about that. Not just any man could, but God's son, God's true human son, he could. Wow. So I like that. So in Romans, the fifth chapter in verse 19... Paul puts it this way, for just as through the disobedience of the one man, that is Adam, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, that is Jesus, the many will be made righteous. So, wow, but it's through a man. Now my challenge is this, God can't die to begin with. If God dies, you know you haven't got God yet. God is by definition immortal. That means incapable of death. That's the whole point, right? My goodness. Okay. So God doesn't die, but don't allow uh, this thought to get away that, that what we should be celebrating is that God had a son like us. In fact, not just like us, he was one of us. That's, that's a big point for us. It's a huge, huge point. It's a great matter, right? Okay. Then uh, the fourth principle that Paul was a Jesus as co-creator of the new creation believer <laughs> and that he was first in that creation. This is interesting because I didn't always understand this either. I had to reevaluate this. Uh, I was taught well, as a child and up uh, that Jesus was the creator in the Genesis creation. And then I began to realize after a while well, wait a minute, am I right about that? Because I didn't really ever find a scripture that said Jesus was the creator of the Genesis creation. But actually, Jesus is co-creator of a what? A new creation. Not the one in Genesis. That one fell. That one had all sorts of trouble. And, and Adam is the one that brought that problem to bear, right? But the new creation is one that's in Christ Jesus. And we find, well, you know, there's scriptures and we just overlook them or read over them, I think. But we find that the scriptures are saying things like, you know, if any man is in Christ, he, that man or that person, that woman, they are a new creation, aren't they? Ha, huh. new creation. What's this new creation thing all about? Aren't we just still Adam stuff? 
No, not exactly anymore. We, we, we're, we, you know, we have that connection, but now we have connection to something new, a new creation in Christ Jesus. We discover that God is making this new creation through, by Christ. The first one, in a sense, he made by Adam. You know, the whole human race came forward, came forth from Adam or by Adam. But the new creation, the one that, that Jesus is the first one of, remember it referred to him as the firstborn from the dead? What did that verse mean? Paul said that. The firstborn from the dead. The first one to be born from the dead. To what? To unending, eternal life. The first one to be born to that. And then after him then, all the others who are in him are participants in that new life, in that new creation. So, wow, when you begin to think about that then, and we said before, we looked at Jesus and he talked about creation. He never once said, oh, when I created the world. No, he said, when he, my father, when God created, so Jesus didn't come on the scene back there, and that's very confusing when you think about it. Jesus created the world, and so then he, you know, it gets really confusing after that. But I think this, to understand that Jesus is God's, God's one through whom God is creating the new creation, then we can say, hey, that does begin to make a lot of sense. And you begin to look at all the scriptures that talk about the new creation, and you think, oh, well, wait a minute. We're confusing it talking about Jesus being the, the creator of the new creation with the Genesis creation. Stop. We need to think about this. In, uh, in some, then, Paul never said that Jesus created the Genesis creation, but rather that God, through Jesus or by Jesus, uh, the, uh, that he is, in fact, creating the new creation, and in fact, Jesus is the first in terms of time in the new creation, and that Jesus is first in terms of priority in the new creation. He is the Lord of the new creation, and we're already participating, if you're a Christian, we're already participating in that that is in, in the makings and which is coming in terms of this new creation. Wow. So when you read about the kingdom of God in the New Testament, it's wonderful. But keep in mind that the kingdom of God relates to the new creation, not the old one so much, right? The kingdom of God is the new creation. Who's the first to be born from the dead? According to Paul, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Are there others going to be born from the dead in that sense, then never to die again? Yeah, and that's, that's us who trust in Jesus. So, hey, we're participants in this new creation. We should come to appreciate it, and we should come to say, hey, and by the way, how's this new creation, how's this new creation happening? It's happening because God is doing this through Jesus. I said it's interesting, and we don't realize it, but Jesus was actually creating on the cross. Oh, I don't mean out here somewhere. I mean by his very death. He was opening the way for the new creation, for the new hope, for the new eternal life, for the new coming working kingdom of God. And all of this is with us even now, but much more so coming in the future. Paul's, I'm calling it principle number five for a few minutes. And uh, uh, Paul believed then in this fifth principle Paul believed Jesus literally began when he was begotten in his mother. I do now as well. I think the literal preexistence doesn't work. Conceptual preexistence, to me, explains everything quite well. Okay, so let's look again then at what Paul is saying. Paul believed uh, that Jesus literally began, literally began, when he was begotten in his mother. She was a virgin. What do you think? She knew no man. This was her own testimony. And, uh, but God worked a work in her to cause this child to be conceived, to cause this child uh, to be born. But Luke then was not a literal preexistence guy and didn't have much to say about conceptual preexistence. That just wasn't the way he went in his presentation of the book of Luke. 
So Luke begins, and if you read the book of Luke, and that's what you read, and that's what you see and understand, you're going to come away from Luke realizing that Jesus began when God said, hey, Mary, you're going to have a baby. Fantastic. Luke doesn't say a thing about, oh, by the way, and he's going to be a preexistent angel coming down and getting inside of you. No. Or a preexistent God or part of God or a person of God or something. He never tells Mary that. She had no such idea as that. And uh, so Luke doesn't have such a notion. Luke is a Jesus began when he was begotten in his, his mom kind of guy. But Paul then was a partner, a, a traveling buddy of Luke's. They knew each other. They, they went well together. And uh, as Luke gathered information for his writings, he had Paul even as uh, his friend and compatriot. So let's take notice then. Luke then says, when you read Luke, here's what Luke's view of this was in Luke 135. Very important verse, by the way. Every, every Christian should know this verse and really think about what it's saying. But Luke is saying in Luke 135, the angel said to her, meaning Mary, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you because the Spirit of God's going to come upon you. And because the power of God's going to come upon you, whoa, then what happens? Therefore, because of that, the child to be born will be holy, okay, and he will be called the Son of God. But notice the therefore. Because the Spirit comes upon you, because the Spirit causes this child to be begotten, conceived in you, because the Spirit gives this, this child his existence, that child will be called the Son of God. That's not hard, is it, when you think about that? So he's not talking about a preexistent thing, right? Uh, he's talking about a coming into existence thing. And that's wonderful. Now Jesus is one of us, really one of us. Now his dad is, happens to be very different. His dad is God Almighty, right? And, and his mom was a virgin, and that's wonderful. That's exciting. And that, that's part of what made him able to be the sacrifice for the rest of us. But it didn't turn him into something other than one of us because, remember, we said that God made Adam, as it were, from scratch. Adam didn't even have a mama. And yet, what was Adam? When God got done with Adam, Adam was what God wanted him to be, a man. So here we have then this what Paul refers to as the last Adam, the second Adam, which is Jesus. And what is God saying about this one? Wow, or what's the deal with him? This, this one, this Adam, wow, he is a man also. That's what God wanted him to be, and that's what he was. It's beautiful. But he doesn't say to Mary, Mary, an angel's going to come down and come upon you and get inside of you and be born as a baby. <gasps> no. But neither does he say, oh, Mary, you know, God, God, part of God, or one of God person things, it's going to come down and get inside of you and be born. No. Oh, for goodness sake. I don't know how all this gets started. <laughs> well, we actually, we do. We have the history for it. But anyway, but actually, what the angel tells Mary is the Spirit of God's going to come on you and work a miracle. Now, that makes sense. He's going to cause a baby to be born in you. That's the person. If you want to talk about a person, it's the father, by extension, his spirit working in Mary. That's the reason that the spirit of God is one and the same as the father. And so what the spirit does, the father has done. So who's the father of Jesus? The father, the spirit in a sense. Okay, so, but not one scripture that Luke wrote ever talks about, oh, but a God person has got, got down and came into Mary. A God is going to come down and get inside of you and be born as a human being, as a baby. No. We've got a different storyline going, don't we? Do you think the angel knew 
Do you think the angel understood when the angel used the word therefore? The, the Spirit of God's going to come on you. The power of God's going to come on you. Cause the baby to be born. You're going to conceive. And because the power and Spirit of God does this, that child will be called the Son of God. Hey, that's what we believe. I like that. It's the human Son of God. The human Jesus. That's the one who's the true Son of God. So anyway, now let's follow through then. If Paul was a friend of Luke's, and he was, and they, uh, they were together. But notice how Paul says this in Galatians 4 and 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. In looking at John's writings, what is done before God sends people? They get born first, actually, don't they? Okay. So this son that God sends is first actually born of a woman and born under the law. That's how he came to be. Then he gets sent, right? We talked about that before. Remember Jesus speaking to Pilate? And he says, you know, this is the reason I was born. This is the reason I was sent. Sent by who? Sent by God. For what purpose? He was sent on mission, Commission, if you will. And we talked about that with John's writings. But Paul, I think, has the same thing because guess what? This, this phrase, sent, you may recognize this, this word or the root of it, ex apostolo, to be sent. Do you recognize a fairly common word in the middle of that? Apostle, exactly. The word apostle. Now that's interesting. Because actually the word apostle refers to one who is sent, sent, sent. Okay, so this is interesting. And that's the word that Paul is using here when he talks about God sent his son. Not, not literally from heaven. He sent his son, having been born of a woman, having been made under the law, or born under the law. Now he sends him out to what? He sends him out to the world, as we discussed before, the cosmos, meaning the system, the program of things. And he sends him out there and commissions him to do what? Speak the word and to become the savior of that same world. Right? As you have sent me into the world, the cosmos, out into the system, the program, after he was born, God sent him on mission. Even so, I have sent, same word, them, speaking of his disciples, into the world. Does that mean that the disciples were in some other planet or some other part of the universe and then God worked and said, okay, now it's time for you to be sent into the... No, it's not talking about the globe. It's talking about the system, the, the societies of the world, the system, the program of the world. God sends people to the world. And Jesus, notice, says this. He equates the two. As you, Father, have sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world, which means these two sendings are the same thing. So John 17, 18. By the way, then, this is the same word, the ex apostolo, or apostolo, in Acts 22 and 21, where uh, Paul is saying, then Jesus appeared to him uh, in a vision, whatever, and said, then he said to me, go, for I will send. There's the same word. I will send you far away to the Gentiles. That's exciting. But it's the same, same language. Paul was sent too. And that's the reason he's called an apostle. That's from the word that we're looking at, right? A sent. In Hebrews 3 and 1, then, I really like this. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, brothers, holy partners in a heavenly calling, consider that Jesus, the apostle, the apostle, same word then as we've been talking about, uh, apostolos, from the same root word, and high priest of our confession. Consider Jesus the apostle, the one who got sent. Wow. How was he sent? Sent the same way that the disciples were sent. Sent the same way that Paul was sent. When did God send him? After he was born, not before. God sent, other than in the plan of God, in the program of God, 
God had in mind to send him uh, before he was before he ever was uh, was born. Uh, but then he didn't actually literally get sent until after he was born. Okay. So the conclusion then is this on Paul's stuff, and you can check me out on this. Don't accept something I'm saying without checking it out uh, for yourself. But read the scriptures. But the conclusion is this. On no occasion does Paul say that Jesus literally preexisted himself as a non-human being. Rely on these five principles that we've talked about. Take a look at them and think about how would those apply to this. And then perhaps just as importantly, here's the other thing. Don't read into Paul things he isn't actually really saying. I don't think there's anything in Paul that you're going to encounter that you can't pretty well grasp or understand. And it should make sense to you.